All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out what check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A researcher is using a multiple baseline design to assess the impact of a new memorization strategy on students' test performance. The intervention is introduced at different times for three students, and repeated measurements are taken to document each student's performance before and after the strategy is applied. What feature of baseline logic is demonstrated here? So when we think about baseline logic, we're thinking about things like we're, we're thinking about replication, we're thinking about prediction, we're thinking about verification. When we are predicting, we are taking our baseline and we're saying if intervention never stops, never starts, then baseline would continue. So if this is baseline one, this is intervention. We introduce intervention and whatever might happen, but this is our prediction. Verification comes when we remove baseline and we go back here. That verifies our prediction. So what would replication be? Well, replication would be our second intervention condition because we're trying to replicate what we did initially. So if we have a researcher who's using this multiple baseline design to assess the impact of memorization strategy, and they're introducing the intervention for three students, and they're trying to measure each student's performance before and after the strategy is applied, what are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to replicate the intervention. They're introducing it for three different students. They're repeating the measurements. They're looking at performance before and after. They're trying to see, have they been able to replicate that intervention ac across three students? Reversal and fidelity are not part of baseline logic, and they're not predicting here. They're attempting to replicate that intervention. I know I drew a reversal design there, but the same stands for a multiple baseline design. If we have a multiple baseline design, something like this, each time we do our intervention, we are replicating what we did before. So baseline logic, Prediction, verification, replication. If you're going to explain negative reinforcement to a parent, which of the following explanations would be best? When we are discussing things with stakeholders and parents, we don't want to use jargon, and we want to explain things in a way that they're going to understand and retain. So if you get a question that's asking you, how would you explain such and such? You want to do it in the most straightforward manner possible, while also being conceptually systematic and accurate. So A, we are going to start removing things following a problem behavior in an attempt to decrease that behavior. Well, if we're talking negative reinforcement, that's not going to decrease behavior. So A is wrong. B, we are going to remove a stimulus following a challenging behavior in an attempt to reduce the future occurrence of that behavior. Again, we're not trying to reduce anything with negative reinforcement. B is incorrect. C, we're going to start providing what the client likes in an attempt to increase good behavior. So we want to increase behavior, but we're not providing anything with negative reinforcement. We are going to do what? D, we are going to remove something from the environment in response to a behavior in an attempt to increase that behavior. Yes. Now, could you explain that even more simply? You could. But given our other answer choices are just incorrect, D is going to be the best answer. Last Saturday, a baseball stadium set a new record for most water and beer ever sold during a single game. On that same day, the temperature reached over 100 degrees with no clouds in the sky. What type of motivating operation was likely in play in this scenario relative to the water and beer record? When we think about motivating operations, we think about establishing and abolishing operations. And the question wants to know what was in play relative to water and beer. Well, what do we know about water and beer? We know a lot of water and beer were sold. We also know 
it was hot, over 100 degrees. So if we sold a lot of water and beer and it was very hot, what happened? Well, very likely there was an establishing operation for water and beer, for liquid due to the heat. So if you look at A, establishing operation, it's very likely that water and beer were established as more valuable than before because it was hot. There doesn't appear to be any abolishing operation. With an abolishing operation, value decreases, but that doesn't appear to be the case. Double the fact, or considering the fact, that behavior increased, right? Of an evocative effect took place. More water and beer were bought because they were more valuable, because it was so hot. So what motivating operations were in play? Well, both an establishing operation and an evocative effect. A chemist is training lab assistants to respond differently to specific chemical indicators based on color. For example, a blue indicator requires adding a base, while a red indicator requires adding an acid. What type of discrimination is being targeted? Discrimination or, or stimulus discrimination is just telling the difference between stimuli. Now, in this case, the chemist wants the lab assistants to respond differently based on color. So not only do they need to know to add a base or an acid, but they're also responding to these indicators. And so when we have additional indicators, such as, or additional SDs, such as colors on top of these indicators, that would make this conditional. Simple discri discrimination is just A or B. There's no additional stimuli. There's no additional discriminative stimuli. There's no additional antecedent. It's just tell me the difference between A and B. With conditional discrimination, not only do they need to know the difference between blue and red, but they also need to know the, the blue is for base and the red is for acid. So they're discriminating on multiple levels. They see a blue indicator, they know it's blue, and then they know they need to discriminate to base. So it's conditional what chemical they're using is conditional on discriminating between the colors. This is a more complex way to teach stimulus discrimination. You get a call from a parent one day complaining that one of the technicians on your team is always on their phone during sessions. You schedule supervision for the very next day, but the entire time you're supervising, you don't see your technician use their phone even once. What might explain this discrepancy in a behavior analytic way? Let's think about our discrepancy, right? That's what the question is focused on. And what is the discrepancy? If you always start by asking yourself, what is the question focused on? What is the question asking? We can really get down to what we want to focus on quickly. The problem here is a parent said one technician is always on the phone during sessions. A parent told you that. So you supervised and you never saw the phone even once. That's our discrepancy. Phone all the time, phone not even once. So you have to ask yourself what changed. Well, you arrived. So if you were affecting the technician's behavior just by being there, what do we consider that? Hey, the complaint was incorrect. Well, we don't know that for sure. There's a lot of explanations for why this happened rather than just the complaint was incorrect. B, the technician ex is experiencing reactivity. Yes, behavior analytically, we would first consider reactivity. Your presence is clearly going to change their behavior. C, observer drift has taken place. Well, the parent, it's not her job to measure the technician's behavior. So there was no way to tell what she was observing in the first place to conclude that observer drift could have even been a thing. And then D, the technician knows they can't use their phone around you. Possibly, but is that behavior analytic that they know they can't do something? No, it's much more at behavior analytic to just say, well, you're there and the technician is experiencing reactivity. The token economy has been effective in a fifth grade classroom at getting students to complete work during independent study time. Recently, a couple of the students are saving up all their tokens and not spending them on anything. 
If this is an issue, what might you try? So is this an issue? Let's start there. The question wants to know if it's an issue, then what might you try? So is this even an issue? Well, you have an economy where students aren't spending tokens. Why is that a problem? Well, the spending of the tokens are what make the tokens valuable and effective. We have to have that exchange. If your money, you never spent it because it had no value and you didn't want to buy anything, then the value of the money goes down. So we need those tokens to be exchanged because that's how those tokens retain their effectiveness and the value. So we know this is an issue. So if this is the case, what should you try? Because token economies should be organic and they should be changing. A, this is not an issue. The plan is effective. No changes are needed. It is an issue. We want the learners spending the tokens. That's how those tokens remain valuable. B, decrease the variety of backup reinforcers available. Well, if you decrease the choice, how is that going to change the fact that they're not spending their tokens? C, decrease the value of the tokens. Well, if the tokens are even less valuable, that means they go, they're going to need even more tokens. So saving them up becomes even more of a better option. So D, increase the variety of backup reinforcers available is going to be your best option. If we have more choices to spend our tokens on, maybe then those tokens will get spent on a more consistent basis. Token economies should be organic, they should be always changing, and they should adapt to the needs of your learners or clients. All of the following are considered stimulus classes except for what? All right, easy question here, straightforward. We have different types of stimulus classes. Which of these is not a stimulus class? Is there such thing as a formal stimulus class? Yes, stimuli that share the same form or topography. What about temporal stimuli that is that occur at the same point in time? Yes, antecedent and consequence stimulus stimuli, for example. What about functional stimuli that evoke the same responses? Absolutely. What about generalizable? Generalizable is not one of our stimulus classes. The one we would replace that with would be arbitrary. So generalizable is not considered a stimulus class. A pediatrician who just started working at her first hospital job is unconfident in her abilities. Our supervisor recommends the pediatrician take data on how often she effectively treats a patient as it might put things in perspective. The supervisor is recommending what? What does a supervisor want this pediatrician to do? What does she tell her? She says, you should take data on how often you effectively treat patients. So she's telling the pediatrician to take data on her own behavior. So when we are taking data on our own behavior, what are we doing? Well, we are A, self-monitoring. We're monitoring our own behavior. Self-instruction is like self-talk, where we're prompting ourselves through something. Self-evaluation would be taking whatever we monitored and then comparing it. We're not comparing it yet, or the pediatrician isn't comparing it yet. She's just taking data on herself. She's monitoring herself. And then self-control is self-management, essentially. And self-management is our overall strategy. Monitoring, instruction, evaluations are pieces of that strategy. So we're not talking about the overall strategy. We're talking about the specific strategy of self-monitoring. On an ABA company's business social media page, the company posted a success story for a former client with permission. Underneath the post, an employee and technician commented, great job team, there is no behavior we can't handle. Could this be an ethical issue? All right, let's think critically here. We're looking at ethics. First, let's start with the idea of the testimonial. On the business social media page, with permission, a success story for a formal client was posted. Is there anything wrong with that? No, you can use testimonials from former clients with permission on your business social. That's okay. But this employee and technician said, we can handle any behavior. There is no behavior we can't handle. Why might that be a problem? Well, because that is implying that we can fix anything, that there's nothing we can't do. And you might say, well, that's not a big deal. But on your exam, we've got to be very by the book. So let's look at A. No, the post was made with permission and the comment was not out of line. Well, you know, I'm sure the comment, or we can assume the comment wasn't said with any malicious intent, 
But if somebody reads that and says, no behavior we can't handle, and then they come to your company and you can't handle the behavior, what does that say about the company and about ABA? B, yes, you should not post anything specific about clients on social media. Former client testimonial with permission, it's fine. C, no, there are no rules regarding former clients. There are still rules regarding former clients around privacy and consent and everything else. So you still got to be very aware. D, yes, the comment may misrepresent the profession of ABA. That's the issue here, right? By posting this, we might be misrepresenting our profession because if they come to you and you can't handle the behavior, what does that say about ABA as a profession? Is this very strict? It is, but on the exam, you've got to be by the book, right? And we have to be as ethical as possible. There was an electric fence in Will's backyard so that their dog does not dig holes under the fence. One day, Will got curious and decided he would touch the fence. The fence gave an extremely painful shock and Will never went near the fence again. The shock is a what? So what did the shock produce? The shock produced pain. And so do we need to be conditioned to this shock for it to be punishing? Well, no. If you touch a fence that shocks you, you don't have to be conditioned that that pain, right, if the antecedent is, if the response is touching the fence and the consequence is a painful shock, that shock never needed to be conditioned. So the shock is acting as an unconditioned punisher. It doesn't have to be conditioned. That pain is not conditioned. Pain is unconditioned. And it isn't socially mediated because the fence provided the consequence, not another person. Pretty straightforward punishment question. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Like, subscribe, and share when you pass. Let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.